so good morning everyone so in this particular presentation we'll be basically looking into how the fire engineers get involved in the building designs and above all what are the benefits of the bespoke fire engineering designs so first of all i would like to thank all the organizers for giving us an opportunity to share knowledge as well as all the presenters and the participants who have taken their time to make this event grand successful with this first of all we'll just have a look on what we are going to cover in today's presentation i'll start with giving an introduction about innovation fire engineering then we'll have a look on the uk legislation specific to the building fire safety aspects then the next question that you might have already in mind is how a fire engineer gets involved in the design process and what methodologies they actually take into consideration to design the buildings what is the role of this CFD in fire engineering designs? To clarify these concepts, we'll also go through a small case study which demonstrates all these concepts as well. And finally, we'll end the presentation by looking into the aspirations of the end users in the past as well as in the present. So innovation fire engineering is based in Leeds. Our main goal or one of the focus area that we actually work on is develop innovative fire engineering solutions. So that is one of the key core value of our company. And talking in terms of collaboration, which is another value is we basically work with all the team members in our company and try to bring up with the best idea possible for the building design. In terms of integrity, we basically work with all the stakeholders, make them add like uh, understand these are the issues with the particular design. So we, these are the necessary solutions or mitigative measures that we need to take in the design. And considering all the views and perspectives, we basically come up with the best solution possible. And finally, it's excellent service. We respond to all the queries as soon as possible and try to achieve the goals of the client. And as an end result, this basically adds on values to the project. We could consider delivering flexibilities in the design, come up with an economical solution without compromising the safety level. All right, let's talk about the UK legislation, which is specific to the building fair safety. The primary legislation in the UK that was the Building Act of 1984, which was previously discussed again. So from there, under which we basically built up the secondary legislation, which is the building regulations 2010. This has got some technical requirements which has been mentioned. So for and it is covered in different parts and part B is basically specific for our fire safety aspects. And we have got five functional requirements mentioned here B1 to B5. Generally, the next question what comes to your mind is how do you meet these functional requirements? The answer to that question is the guidance documents. So guidance documents provide you with the guidance to meet these functional requirements, which helps you to basically meet your design criteria and the legislation in the UK. Finally, you might have a thought of what these B1 to B5 talks about. Let's try to think this in terms of fire happening in a building. If a fire occurs in a building, the first thing you want to do is the alert the occupants of the building as soon as possible. So they can initiate the evacuation. So the B1 basically helps to uh, design our buildings such a way that the people are alerted in case of a fire at the earliest and there is a proper means of safe escape to a reasonable point in the building or outside the building. That is what the B1 basically covers. Now B2, B3 and B4 are related to the fires limiting the fire spread aspects. So B2 and B3 specifically talks about limiting the fire spread within the building and this on the linings, which is especially the B2 and B3. We try to contain the fire and make it only in a particular area or room of fire origin. We are basically trying to contain the fire. Also, we don't want the structure to collapse when a fire occurs. So the structural safety aspects also are being considered here. Then comes the B4 where the 
as you have seen in Grenfell, that is an external fire spread that we had. But there are other consequences that ad adjacent buildings can also get, probably get uh, ha have a fire due to the, the fire in this particular buildings. So external fire spreads can be limited, and that is one of the other functional requirement that we need to meet in the buildings. And finally, the firefighters are coming into picture. So we need to design the building in such a way that they have proper access to the building and facilities to carry out their operations at the earliest as well as in a safe manner. So coming to this guidance documents, there are two ways. Basically, you can meet these functional requirements B1 to B5. The one is the prescriptive or code based design and second approach is a based or fire safety engineering approach. Now in the prescriptive design, you have a set of rules. You describe how a building must be constructed. This is basically applicable for common building designs. So in the UK, we have the approved document B, the volume one and volume two, which discusses the dwellings and the buildings other than dwellings. Then if you require more flexibility in your designs, then you can go into PS double and double line. In addition to that, specific to the occupancy, we have other fire safety guidance like BS triple nine one for residential buildings. For schools, we have BB100. And for healthcare, we have HM guidance documents. Now, the question is, what, what if you have got a complex building design which has got innovative design? So in these cases, you cannot directly go with the prescriptive de designs because it will be deviating from the requirements mentioned in these prescriptive codes. In that case, you basically move off forward to enter into the fire safety engineering approach, which is the term that we use in UK. So here we set, it's basically a set of goals. We state how a building is to perform under a wide range of conditions. So we need to demonstrate adequate safety for the design and demonstrate that these the functional requirements are being met. And this, of course, requires a detailed understanding and technical expertise. Now, for this BS7974, as you can see in the figure here, is one of the best documents that we could use. And it has got seven parts, which gives different aspect of fire safety to be considered in the design. Similarly, another document is CIPC Guidance E, which gives an overview of the fire safety engineering approach. Now we'll move forward and see how we can go in a step-by-step -step process in the fire safety engineering approach. So this is one of the structured methodology that has been proposed or recommended in 7974 2019 document. I would say one of the most important point as a starting is the qualitative design review. So this is the first stage in engineering design where you try to understand the building characteristics, the occupant characteristics, then what are the fire issues or the hazards and the related consequences that you might have with the plan you have for the building. So it's basically start with once you get the plan of the building from the architects. So we identified what are the issues, then what changes we can make in that and what additional fire safety systems need to be incorporated. So when we propose something, especially in fire safety engineering approach, we are basically de deviating from the prescriptive guidance. Then we need to analyze this design and evaluate this with a acceptance criterion. And once you evaluate and free and you can demonstrate that the design, the proposed design you are uh, is meeting these acceptance criteria, then you can carry on with developing the report and going it for the peer review process and once you are done with the all quality control measures internally and externally, then you can issue that to the client. So this is one of the process we follow for the fire for developing the fast strategies for the building designs. So what are the methods that we use in this process? When we deviate from this prescriptive guidance, one is a qualitative assessment we can do, but that is something which we do for slight deviations from the uh, code code requirements. However, if you require detailed analysis, we will go into the quantitative approaches. So in quantitative 
assessment, you can have two kinds of things. So either you can directly go with a deterministic approach or a probabilistic methods. So in the deterministic approach, basically you consider a worst case fire scenario in the building and that will be the starting point of your design. In the probabilistic approach, it considers a wide range of scenarios which can occur, especially in terms of fire within the building and also takes into account the failure of the different fire safety systems and the how uh, like the manual extinguishment, whether it is done or whether it was successful or not. All these kinds of things we can consider in probabilistic methods going into event tree analysis, fault tree analysis, etc. Uh, but this is yeah extensive process, I would say. Anyway, even if you follow any of these approaches, you want some criteria to evaluate your results. So the acceptance criteria that we can have is an absolute criteria or a comparative criteria. For the probabilistic assessments, you can also have ALARP, which is as low as reasonably practicable. That is another approach. But to sim simplify, we just discussed right now the absolute and comparative. So to give more idea on absolute conditions or criteria, let's imagine that you have got a design. You consider the life safety which is a minimum requirement which we need to meet anyway in any of those guidance documents. For that, you come up with a design objective. Let's say I, I'm saying I don't want my occupants basically to expose to the uh, any of the smoke if a fire occurs in a compartment. That is a design objective I set. And for that design objective, I come up with an acceptance criteria or a performance criteria. So you can say that the smoke layer should be always kept at a height of more than 2.5 meter from the floor level. So this is an absolute criteria. So, so uh, I think that actually gives you an idea of what the absolute criteria is. So that will be the uh, evaluation point for our design. Now comparative uh, and acceptance criteria comes into picture when you compare your proposed design with a reference design. So the reference design is the code compliant design. And if you are able to demonstrate the, that the proposed design does not increase or have a risk greater than what has been said in this code compliant design, then it can be considered acceptable. Now, one of the key things or ideas that you need to keep in mind is the asset asset analysis. So this is one of the ideas you can keep in mind so that it gives you better clarity. Now, when a fire occurs in a compartment, there will be some untenable un conditions coming into picture with time. But before that, I want all the people within that compartment to move to a point of reasonable safety. The time it takes for the untenable conditions to occur, that is what we basically call as ASET, which is the available safe egress time. And the R set is the time which takes for the people to move to a reasonable safe point. And it has different sections like detection time, alarm time, then the pre movement time and movement time. And these all adds up the R set. When we design something, I basically wanted to push forward this R set as soon as far as possible towards the right and reduce this R set. So which means I want to bring this R set towards the left as much as possible. So for example, if you have an enhanced dictation system, you can reduce the dictation and alarm time. So this can be pushed towards the left side. So the margin of safety will be higher. And this is one of the criteria you need to keep in mind there that A set should be always greater than R set and there should be a sufficient margin of safety. Why? Because the R set itself has got many uncertainties. So similarly, as it has as well when we do CFT analysis and everything, but that is that is one of the reasons that you need to have adequate margin of safety between asset and asset. Right, with this concept, we can enter and highlight the point of the CFT modeling of fires. We have mentioned previously about our asset. So when this untenable conditions occur, this is something which we can assess using CFT. Within the fire engineering community, we basically utilize a CFT package, Fire Dynamic Simulator, FTS. 
So there are other packages like ANSYS Fluent and OpenForm, which you might have already heard. However, this is one of the widely used uh, packages in this within FAR engineering community, and you get the post-processing results as shown over here. There are different uses when we use uh, incorporate the CFT in the, our analysis. So you can assess the tenability conditions, how long it takes for the smoke buildup in large compartments, uh, then assess the thermal radiations. So all these are the benefits or the uses of CFT in fire engineering. As previously mentioned, now if I need to push to the A set towards the right, right side as soon as possible and reduce the R set towards left, and especially when you deviate from the code, you need to have some fire safety systems. I would mention this as a compensatory feature. To reduce R set, one of the key way is the automatic fire detection system, which gives you early detection and alarm. Then similarly to contain the fire and its growth, all these we can actually incorporate the suppression systems. So you have the sprinkler systems, water mill systems. So these are few options there. Then smoke and heat control systems and to contain the fire within the room of fire engine, you can go for enhanced compartmentations or fire curtains and for the benefits of proper or safe evacuation and easy evacuation, you can go for intelligent active dynage signage systems. With these key compensatory features, you come up with a design. And if you need to assess this proposed design is meeting these functional requirements, then CFT will be helpful at that stage. To illustrate this concept, we'll just go through a small case study. So this is a care home that we have worked and at the moment it's under construction as you can see in the figure. So it's a three story building and we have got vulnerable population groups in this building. So basically it's the elderly group as well as people with cognitive issues. And there are residential or living units within this particular building. There are staffs as well for assistance. But one of the key characteristics that you need to consider over here is these people or the occupants might require assistance during evacuation. Then sleeping is one of the risk that is involved. Then some of the, especially the people having cognitive issues, they might sometimes refuse to the instructions given by the staffs during evacuations. So these are some of the behavioral changes or occupancy characteristics we need to consider over here. In addition to that, there were some client requirements. Only if you have been mentioned here, but one of the important things you need to consider as far as this example is being considered is the long and wide open corridors because the client wants to give a better living experience to the residents. So accordingly, the plans were created uh, by the architect for the building and one of the deviation that we have seen over here is an extended travel distance. So if you go into ADB, ADB mentions that a maximum travel distance of only nine meters is possible in a single direction. But when we look into this particular design of the building, we have up to 25 meters of travel distances in the corridors. So what is the consequence over there if you don't take sufficient fire safety aspect, uh, systems in the design is you can have fire spread within the building and this can have a catastrophic effect. In addition to an enhanced dictation and fire alarm system within the building, which has been already proposed for this extended travel distance, we have come up with this following compensatory features. So one is this mechanical smoke extraction system within the corridors then the automatic sprinkler systems within the living units, which has got the quick response sprinkler heads. And in addition to the compartmentation recommended by ADB, we also install the self-closing devices to the fire doors of these living units. So the advantage is that once you actually leave from this particular living unit, the door automatically closes and the compartmentation can be ensured. So if you don't have the self-closing devices, you, you can forget some time to close the door, which actually uh, spreads the smoke within the corridor, although you have got the mechanical smoke control systems and everything. But we want this system to be as much as robust uh, when we deliver the design or 
uh, design a fire safety solution for a building. So how do we demonstrate this is meeting the requirements or the functional requirements? So we have undertaken a quantitative analysis. We went, go through this or went for an deterministic approach. We set an absolute criteria, which is specifically, specifically what I'm discussing over here is for the escape phase, because we have also analyzed for the firefighting phase where the firefighters comes into picture over here. So the criteria over here that we are looking at is the temperature and visibility at two meters above the floor level. And this is set as per the fire safety engineering guidance documents given or available in the UK, the 7974 part six, we have been we have used to set these criteria. In addition to that, we have also set another criteria based upon the SEA guidance. So here the core load should be tenable within three minutes of the fire room closing uh, door closing basically in during the means of escape phase. And using FDS, as I mentioned before, we have created the model here. This is uh, one of the fire location that we have chosen for analysis because we have some other locations we have, we have considered in the analysis as well. So for the purpose of this example, this is considered to be a worst case scenario since we have got the stairs over here. This is nearest room. And if you have got a furthest room over here, you you have a travel distance of let's say 24 meters. So this is con if the fire is spreading or smoke is spreading to these corridors from this particular room, then this is going to affect the people evacuating from other rooms. So that is why we have considered this as a worst case scenario and considered this fire location. Now, we have considered a conservative assessment or analysis for how long it will take for the people to escape from here in this room of fire origin and enter into the staircases. Because we have got an early dictation and warning systems, the staffs are already in the within the floor because at the corner we have got this uh, staff room. And according all these criteria, we have going for the conservative analysis and found that it takes almost like 340 minutes for the people to enter, sorry, 340 seconds to enter into this staircases. Now the analysis is with respect to all these criteria. So after 10 seconds, the residents left the suit. You are trying to see the ten uh, tenability limits. So temperature and this is visibility. And you can see over here, the temperature is actually not exceeding anywhere more than 60 degrees Celsius. However, in the fire room, of course, you have higher temperatures and the visibility is very less over there as well. Now, the visibility is reduced initially when you have opened the door because the smoke will enter into this area and this basically activates the smoke control system. After two minutes, the fire door has been closed. You see the visibility, so uh, the temperature conditions are OK and the visibility conditions are getting better and it is above the set limit as well. And after three minutes, all the conditions are fine and the fire room is basically having the most of the issues, but basically we are saying the fire has been contained over there. So, so this basically helps us to demonstrate that we are meeting the set criteria and the proposed design is acceptable in for specifically in this case for this extended travel distance. So what is the end result? We have basically brought value to the project because there were many other deviations as well, but altogether, basically we have incorporated a, a flexible design, in, including the architectural aspirations and the requirements of the client. So if you have the common building designs, that is what we basically had previously, then you can definitely go with the prescriptive based guidance documents. But with the advancements of the technology, the new materials of construction, you have got innovative designs coming up as shown here. And for these buildings, we definitely need to go into the performance based approach or the fire safety engineering approach. And that gives more flexibility to the designers and also benefits to the client 
However, this requires more technical expertise and detailed analysis. So with that, we come to the conclusion of the presentation. So now we understood that when a prescription is not what is needed, we want to enter into the fire safety engineering approach. And these bespoke fire engineering designs provides you different benefits. So thank you. That's all. That's all. And yeah, I would like to discuss more if you have any questions to ask about this particular topic. Thank you.